2007 was a new era. A three-game arc had concluded, and all of us were eagerly awaiting the next Kingdom Hearts. Kingdom Hearts 3, some would say. <laughs> you'd see fan box art of Kingdom Hearts 3, you'd see fan art of Kingdom Hearts 3, you'd see fan fictions of Kingdom Hearts 3, you'd see it all. Nomura had other plans, of course. He wanted to make handheld spin-offs. And what this led to is around 13 years of quote-unquote spin-offs, until Kingdom Hearts 3 became the conclusion to a narrative arc rather than the beginning of one. In reality, three new games would begin this second chapter. Kingdom Hearts 358 Days Over 2, yes this is how you pronounce it, don't question it, Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep, and Kingdom Hearts Coded. These three games would later be connected by Dream Drop Distance, with Kingdom Hearts 3 to serve as the follow-up. Legends spoke of a secret movie at the end of both Kingdom Hearts 1 and Kingdom Hearts 2, both of which would tee up the next entries. This ending scene, referred to as Another Side Another Story, served a dual purpose. It hyped people up for Kingdom Hearts 2, but the scene itself would be represented in days. Minus the part where Mickey shows up, it's actually kind of funny to think about that in retrospect. Before we begin, I have to explain, it's pronounced 358 days over two, because this story follows 358 days over two people's lives, Roxas and Shion. I don't know why you can't just say 358 days over two, it is specifically pronounced 358. It's dumb, but I don't make the rules. And to be honest, I kind of admire the effort this man puts into his titles. Now that the HD collections have been released, I feel as though Days as an actual video game has been largely forgotten by all but the most dedicated fans of Kingdom Hearts. New fans will only get the abridged version of the story we all experienced back on the DS. The cutscene collection is serviceable if all you're looking for is to be caught up with the plot and nothing else. It hits on all the important beats and ensures that you won't be lost come future games, and it only takes 3 hours compared to the game's 17 to 20 hour runtime. However, what we have to understand here is that the cutscene collection, though a beautiful remastering of specific scenes that weren't voiced in the original, is still just a collection of cutscenes ripped out of a video game. Without that sense of context, something is going to get lost in the transition, and unfortunately I feel like what we lost is the impact of the story of Roxas, Axel, and Shion. I wouldn't be surprised if new fans weren't as attached to these characters simply because they lack the context and runtime necessary to properly bond with them the same way most Gage fans were forced to back when these collections didn't exist. The more time has passed, the more I've been allowed to ruminate on the game, its goals, its narrative, I've come to admire it in a strange way. Though I completely understand that it would have been very costly to remake the entire game for the HD collections, and for a game that many people played just to get more story, trust me, I understand why it was just cutscene collections, but there's always going to be a part of me that yearns for everyone else to experience the game as it was intended. Even though it isn't always perfect, it weaves narrative with gameplay in a deceptively simple way. I want to talk about how it does this, and what makes it one of the most effectively told stories in the realm of games. This is a Kingdom Hearts 358 Days Over 2 retrospective. As promised, I'm going to run through the important points of Kingdom Hearts 2. Roxas is introduced, and so are the concept of nobodies, beings that lack hearts. His fake life is unraveled, and he merges back with Sora, who then goes to various Disney worlds, unintentionally fueling the organization's plan to complete Kingdom Hearts. We also learn that Ansem, the final boss of Kingdom Hearts 1, was merely a heartless of Ansem the Wise's apprentice, Xehanort, and that Xehanort's nobody, Xemnas, is the head of an organization of nobodies who are causing a bunch of trouble throughout all the worlds. Diz is revealed to be Ansem the Wise, who sacrifices himself to delay Xemnas' plans. Sora, Riku, and Kairi all reunite at the world that never was. Roxas and Namine both acknowledge their other halves, and all is well with the world after Sora and Riku beat up a dragon. Most of the key points to remember about Kingdom Hearts 2 are the concepts introduced, like the organization's plans, the idea of nobodies, and the struggles that accompany those ideas. This leads beautifully into the story of Days, which takes place in between 1 and 2, concurrently with Chain of Memories. It was created to recount Roxas' life before the beginning of 2, and what led him to Diz's data Twilight Town. Presumably at or around the same time Sora became a heartless to save Kairi in Kingdom Hearts 1, 
Roxas came into being, was given a name by Xemnas, and drafted into the organization as their 13th member. He is certainly a distinct nobody because he can't remember ever having a past, and as such he lacks any memory of the ideas that make up a human. He doesn't know why he's in the organization or what their goal is ultimately supposed to achieve, according to Axel he doesn't have emotions, and he doesn't even have a basic grasp of what friendship is supposed to be. For all intents and purposes, he's a newborn baby thrust into the life of an adult working for a cult that decides who and what he is. His goal as the Keyblade Wielder is to defeat the Heartless, thus releasing their hearts and sending them to the world that never was, where they form Kingdom Hearts. A version of Kingdom Hearts, anyway. <laughs> oh, the goal of the organization is to obtain hearts of their own. At least that's what Xemnas is telling everyone. Syx and Axel have a feeling there's a lot more to it, and Zigbar obviously knows what's up, but that's for a future game. I'm getting way too ahead of myself. The point is that Roxas will carry out missions every day. They range from recon missions, where you'll examine a new world and learn new things about it, heartless hunts, which simply involve finding and destroying artificially created heartless, boss hunts, which are almost exactly like they sound, and emblem hunting, which is also pretty much exactly what it sounds like. You'll start the workday with either a cutscene, or by spawning directly at the lounge to configure your character and do some shopping before selecting a mission. This pattern repeats itself scarily often. Configure Roxas, select a mission, complete a mission, return to castle, watch a cutscene at the Twilight Town clock tower, and cash in the day's experience. The mission-based structure makes for quick and easy, get-in and get-out game design that both meshes well with a handheld, and makes for good multiplayer mission design. But that's all they really are. In fact, I'd even go as far as to say the missions are the worst part, especially when you start fighting bosses who each have obscure strengths and weaknesses. Leechgrave, for instance, is immune to magic. For some reason. Nothing about the mission description clues you in on this like other missions do, it's just immune to magic. So if you came in packing a magic build, you'll have to quit the mission, configure a more physical build, and redo the lead-up to that boss. When bosses aren't suddenly immune, you have to be careful not to use too much magic in that lead-up phase, since it is now a finite resource that can only be restocked mid-mission using ethers. Experimenting with the magic system feels way too risky as a result, meaning that unless I knew magic would be helpful, I often stuck to strength builds. Magic in general is fairly hit or miss, with the generic fire spell being more useful than the direct upgrade fire because it homes in on enemies. What you end up casting so often feels slow, clunky, and pointless unless it just so happens to do a lot of damage to a specific enemy or boss. It feels like a huge waste of time, and whenever you aren't fighting bosses or generic heartless, you're just collecting emblems or doing recon. When you focus on this stuff for more than a minute, it tends to fold in on itself. However, when you consider that it's for short play sessions, it makes a little more sense. Even considering that it was made for a handheld, sometimes short play sessions don't even solve the issue. The problem is that there's next to no mission variety. Since you'll be revisiting the same worlds over and over, many times without even advancing the story of that world, all you're gonna find yourself doing is a bunch of meaningless tasks. None of these worlds offer anything surprising. You've been to them all before. Beast Castle, Agrabah, Wonderland, Olympus Coliseum. I guess Neverland has some new environments, but really it just adds a few spacious areas on the rocks next to the ship. We don't get much more from Neverland itself until Birth by Sleep, unfortunately. Very rarely was the gameplay itself the driving motivation. It was mostly everything surrounding that. When I got to meet back up with Tinkerbell, or reluctantly train with Phil after Zigbar abandons Roxas, or to see incredibly unusual pairings like Genie, Roxas, and Shion. It's just very strange to see Roxas doing traditional Kingdom Hearts stuff, you know? See, the problem here is that this game plays like Kingdom Hearts 2, but shoved onto a handheld and with all the concessions you'd imagine it would have to make. Your Keyblade hits don't pack the same punch since the enemies don't always stagger like they used to. You can't so much modify your combos as much as you can switch a Keyblade and use that Keyblade's combo. If you pick a magic keyblade, the physical combo will be slow, imprecise, and near useless, but the magic you throw out will be far more powerful as a result. There's a keyblade for longer air combos, one for higher strength, there's even a mix of strength and magic. This provides a momentary sense of variety, but it's not a deep enough system to compare it to the combo modifiers of Kingdom Hearts 2. All it really does is add a visual flourish to your A button presses, and I'd even say it feels less customizable because it locks you to one Keyblade combo at a time, with all the positive and negative stat changes that accompany it. 
you end up picking your poison rather than your playstyle a lot of the time. The lack of heartless variety accompanies the slower, less in-depth combat to ensure that you'll be bored a majority of the way through. There are only so many times I can fight a shadow or a bomb or a fucking ice cube before it just gets old. Structurally, it's very different from the previous games. Instead of knocking out worlds one by one, you instead do a series of missions for each world that can be considered an arc of sorts. Except you complete the arcs mission by mission, alongside the other missions for other world arcs. By the time you've gotten halfway through Twilight Town, boom, Agrabah shows up. This really screws with the moment-to-moment -moment pacing. You'll go from a heartfelt conversation with Phil where he tells Roxas not to be a stranger, one of the more touching moments of the game, deep into weird Neverland shenanigans you started several hours ago. While it is cool that you go at them from the perspective of a villain, the Disney worlds end up feeling tacked on. Why does the organization need to travel to so many worlds when enough heartless seem to spawn in Twilight Town anyway? The only two new mechanical elements to this game are mechanics that are woefully underutilized. This grid-based, Tetris-style progression system is genius on paper. It allows players to pick and choose whether they want higher levels, more healing items, more powerful movement abilities or weapons. The most powerful upgrades are in weird patterns on purpose, so you have to think about where you place them, and so that it constantly ensures you have to keep asking yourself questions about your loadout. It's a shame the game itself doesn't seem to even acknowledge it, though. For the most part, basic keyblade combos and the occasional magic spell will see you coasting through enemies and boss fights. Some of these bosses take light years to defeat because the damage scaling is totally out of whack. Sometimes you'll shred through bosses and enemies like Swiss cheese, other times you'll be doing chip damage. And for seemingly no reason! Some hitboxes are so tiny that doing any damage at all is a chore, especially this Neverland boss fight where you have to hit the tail of a Heartless that will never stop moving. Enemies sometimes give you very little time to react to their attacks and counter you at seemingly random intervals. As a result, the most effective tactic becomes a hit and run. You'll have to forgive me if I didn't need to think about what panels I was placing where. Doing extra missions gets you more panels, more experience, and thus gives you more options, but I never felt like I needed more options to get by. The fights were so simple and boring that I glided through them with basic Keyblade combos a majority of the time. Unfortunately, it just meant that the system was overly convoluted. The second new system is the Limit Break. At low health, you can sacrifice a small bit of your HP to enter a Limit Break, where Roxas flies around the screen dealing massive damage. Again, really cool idea, but it's harmed by a few nasty, overlooked details. First of all, the moment you initiate this Limit Break, it is very hard to cancel out of. This wouldn't be a problem, except you can still take damage when performing a Limit Break. And since you need to be at low health to trigger it, you can kind of see where this neat new system often threw me. I almost never used limit breaks because they were so unsafe. In almost every circumstance, it would be unequivocally safer to heal up and deal slower combos so you don't get one shot in the middle of your flashy limit break. There are a few brain-dead sponges that are helped along by this system. This side objective in one of the earliest missions is a slog. Who thought this would be fun so early on? You don't have any of your later abilities, so it's most effective to go to lower health, spam your limit break, and call it a day five minutes later. But does that really make the limit breaks good on their own? Are they anything more than a bandage? Why do so many bosses have invulnerability phases that they pull out every five seconds? It feels like you can only get an attack in every few minutes. I do like the movement abilities you gain access to, and the spacious level design was intriguing at first, until you realize that there's not a whole lot to do in them except fight Moo Cartless, click examine on some rubble, or god forbid you push a block across a giant chasm. It's like it has every component that makes the Kingdom Hearts 2 gameplay great, plus some promising new additions, but none of those components are in the right places. Which means we're done, right? A boring, meaningless waste of time that's only really fun if you're an 11 year old stuck in a car. Well. What if I told you that the mundane gameplay is unintentionally one of its greatest strengths? On the surface, the mission-based structure is a complete chore. However, it's also a fantastic way to get the player into the same headspace as Roxas. He works as the organization's puppet for almost an entire year, completing missions day by day, and the repetition of that structure is key to the attachment players will have with Roxas's future disillusionment and his current distractions in the form of his relationship with Axel and Shion. 
You spend a lot of time on missions with other organization members, which is a great way to learn more about their characters, and to better explain how they knew so much about the worlds in Kingdom Hearts 2. I especially like the interactions Roxas has with the Castle Oblivion members, and wish there could have been even more time spent with them. Unfortunately, they get sent off to Castle Oblivion almost as soon as the game starts, and we all know what happens to them there. You can't really place this game in the timeline where it is, and also expect more time with these members, so I understand why we couldn't. It's just a shame, because they do a good job fleshing out the members that we already had more exposure with in Kingdom Hearts 2. Anyway, my point is that though you spend a lot of time with them, it's clear that they aren't trying to form any substantial connection with Roxas. So, the time he spends with Axel and Shion are even more special, since they're some of the only characters who don't yell at him or smack him in the face. But, since he still doesn't have much else to latch onto, he just keeps carrying out missions as he's told, hanging on to the brief hope that he can go have ice cream with his friends after work. Keyword there, work. I doubt this was an intentional move, but playing Days made me associate the missions with work. It was something I had to do to make ends meet, but it was never something I wanted to do. I almost feel like making a handheld game that's as fun as Kingdom Hearts 2 is impossible, especially on the DS. So instead of trying to make it super fun, they made it tolerable. There's a baseline level of satisfaction you get out of these missions in the same way there's a baseline level of satisfaction you get out of doing work, even if you ultimately don't want to do it. The animations and sound effects for defeating Heartless feel instinctively good in the same way they did in the previous games, even if the system lacks the depth that made it exceptional. It brought me closer to Roxas, when he was weakened by Shion and his level was cut in half, or when he gave up his Keyblade to help Shion remember how to use hers. It wasn't fun, but it was necessary. Work is very rarely fun, but often it's the friends you make at work that make the experience tolerable. When you take out the friends, the sense of connection, all you're left with is a meaningless time waster. It's fitting that the parts of the game where I felt most distressed is when Axel or Shion were missing or when there was tension between the trio. Roxas wants desperately for those moments eating ice cream on the clock tower to last forever, but the player knows it won't happen. The player has the benefit of hindsight. More time without Axel and Shion means more time alone, doing missions, going through the motions, and less time overall with friends that won't last forever. Because another subject this game tackles well is identity, even more than Kingdom Hearts 2. Roxas and Shion have no concept of how the world works or what emotions are even supposed to be, meaning that Axel has to be the one to teach them these concepts, often failing to hit at the heart of what they mean or why they're so powerful, likely because he doesn't understand the full extent of them either. It leads to Roxas' definition of friendship being sea salt ice cream, because Axel doesn't know how else to describe it to him. All he knows for sure is that they all don't have hearts. Or does he? He thinks he knows because of what he's been fed by Xemnas, despite being part of numerous scenes where emotions are arguably present. He denies it by positing that maybe they remember what it felt like to have emotions, even though it's all just a thinly veiled justification to keep doing work for the organization, to give some of their arguably wasted time more meaning. After all, you can't just look inside and check whether or not you have a heart. At that point, you just have to go on faith. Roxas and Shion both struggle to seem like they're authentic, to seem like they're real people who can fit in. When, in reality, everyone in the organization is just a tool to serve Zebnus. Literally, in the case of Shion, who was a puppet created to transfer the useful parts of Roxas into something the organization could wield full control over. When they started to learn more about their origins and their purpose, especially Shion, that simple work life is utterly destroyed. Shion learns that she was never supposed to exist, that her only purpose was to steal memories from someone and further the goals of their twisted leader. She tries desperately to cling to her simple life with her friends, the time she'd come to love, but it can't change the fact that this trio is headed down an unavoidable path of tragedy. Axel tries his hardest to keep the unit together despite knowing that none of his options are ideal. He could have told Roxas everything that he found out from the start, but that would only cause a rift between the group sooner. The reason he kept it to himself is because he wanted to be with them as much as he could before reality caught up with them. He's caught between his age-old friendship with Saix, his allegiance to the organization, and his blossoming friendships with Roxas and Shion. The tragic truth is that although Roxas and Shion desperately want to be people, 
They work like everyone else, they laugh like everyone else, they have friendships like everyone else. They aren't allowed to be people. They were created to fulfill a purpose, and when it's clear they can no longer fulfill that purpose, they fade away. It becomes increasingly obvious that you're driving these characters toward their demise while also fueling the desires of an evil man, but you just have to keep going. You have to keep playing the missions, upgrading your character, trying different builds to maintain a sense of brief variety and momentary fun, so that you can maybe get more scenes where the trio get together and be friends for a few minutes. You, like Axel, know it can't last forever. But you also, like Roxas, want it to last forever, to evade the inevitable tragedy as long as humanly possible. You can almost prove how effective the gameplay's relative mediocrity is at getting the player to connect with the overall struggle by pointing to the cutscene collection. You rip out a portion of the hole and expect it to deliver the same way? I watched the cutscene collection before I went back and played Days again for review, and what I found is that the cutscene collection didn't affect me in nearly the same way playing the game did. Sure, it was sad, a lot of sad things were happening on screen, but I didn't cry like I did at the end of the actual game. I wasn't shaken when Axel screamed, WHAT'S YOUR PROBLEM?! Because I hadn't just spent 17 hours trying to keep this broken trio together, trying to stop the train from veering off the tracks, trying to hold on to the good. This story doesn't work when it's just a movie. They cut so much out of the collection, so many minor moments of character building. Remember when Roxas picked up a stick to fight with, and Shion says, Roxas, that's a stick. That's funny. That's a moment of character building for Shion. Shion is a really cute character, and it doesn't get shown off that much. Maybe having it in the collection wouldn't have been important, but it was a nice moment that is relegated to a text blurb synopsis in the collection. Sometimes when visiting Disney Worlds, Roxas will experience a sense of deja vu. But instead of telling you what Roxas is feeling, they show scenes of Sora doing the exact same thing on the bottom DS screen. Without a word, and without disrupting the flow of a normal scene, it shows what Roxas is feeling in that moment. It's harder to understand Roxas when you aren't doing the same things he's doing. You aren't working every day of your life. You aren't experiencing these moments at the clock tower as a reward. You aren't experiencing weird deja vu. You're experiencing disjointed scenes back to back. You're experiencing them in a way that was absolutely never intended. Thus is the art of playing a tragedy. Days shouldn't be fun, should it? If Days was fun, working for the organization would be fun. The struggles of Roxas, Axel, and Shion wouldn't be as hard-hitting. And that thematic core of finding yourself in spite of difficult circumstances and the unsatisfying, life-altering consequences of those revelations would be pointless. As the cutscene collection shows, without that context, it's just a brief glimpse into various moments in Roxas' life to fill in his backstory. Days is so much more than just a piece to fit into a larger puzzle, it deserves to be so much more than that. Yet, because it isn't the height of fun gameplay, I have a hard time recommending anyone play it over just watching the collection. For me, games have the ability to be more than just fun, but I know there are a substantial amount of people that only view games by how fun their gameplay is. I get where they're coming from, but looking at every single game from the same lens can sometimes lead to tunnel vision. If I were the me of several years ago, I would have hated days for being so boring. But that's obviously changed, and I found a new experience I can't get anywhere else. An experience that can only exist in spite of the issues it has. I think I can get my point across the best by looking at the infamous ice cream line. Uh, no. Shion. Who else will I have ice cream with? This line has been memed to hell and back, and out of context, yeah, it is hilariously weird. With context, however, it's heartbreaking. Through the hours and hours you've spent working for the organization, through all the good times and bad, sea salt ice cream, those moments sitting on the clock tower bullshitting away about whatever came to mind, those moments were the highlights, and to Roxas, those moments defined his friendships. Eating ice cream with someone was an action he only considered doing with his two best friends, the only thing he ever truly wanted in life. To be denied that by the very people he'd been working for all along, after realizing that he'd taken them at their word for so long, put so much stock in faith. After doing everything he was ever asked, with his only desire to hang out after work and eat ice cream, they threw him and Shion away. The useless tools that they were. When I hear this line, 
who will I eat ice cream with? It hits me hard. Everything about this climax devastates me. You're forced to fight Shion through all of the areas you've been doing missions in, putting into perspective how useless it all was. Ending with a fight at the clock tower, vector to the heavens blaring in the background. The tragedy has begun, and you can't stop it anymore. Shion is one of the best boss fights in the game, making use of all of the abilities you likely stocked, incorporating some of the best actual bosses of the game, and removing most of their annoying invulnerability phases with the exception of maybe a few moves. Going from place to place, hearing the different boss themes, fighting a different version of her, until it all ends with her giant variant, and again, vector to the fucking heavens playing in the background, pillars of light shooting everywhere, whirlwinds, everything is falling apart at the seams. Ironically, the most fun fight in days is the fight you don't want to do. The fight you never wanted to do. The one where you kill Shion. It really gets to me that none of these characters can do anything to avert the coming sadness. Shion ends up deciding that submitting to her cruel fate is the best option for everyone, and that gets her killed. Roxas decides that defying fate is for the best, and that gets him captured. Axel has no idea what to do about fate, other than to delay it as long as he possibly can, and he ends up losing his two best friends, as we later learn his only reason for existing. You know, people complain that nobody dies in Kingdom Hearts, and that's a fair complaint. However, they instead go through an insane degree of emotional trauma to make up for that, and I think that's a fair substitution? It traumatizes me, that's for sure. After Riku succumbs to the darkness and captures Roxas, the ending theme of Sanctuary plays at the credits. A theme that had once been used to bookend a touching, happy conclusion in Kingdom Hearts 2, a song you associate with joy, is being used in a completely separate context to elicit sorrow to bookend a tragic tale that no one but the player will ever truly know. I resonated with Days in a way I never expected coming back to it. It took so long to make this video because I dreaded the idea of going back and wrestling with the camera to do a bunch of inconsequential missions. There are a lot of ideas in Days that would work so much better in a game that took better advantage of them. The panel upgrade system is genius because it both allows for a wider degree of player freedom while not letting up on the limitations necessary to balance the difficulty. I wouldn't mind seeing it resurface in a future game that is better designed with that in mind. The mission mode is quite fun, I remember having loads of fun with my friends back in the day. Just being able to play as so many different characters, despite how simple their combos are, has a novelty that I want to see explored again in the future. That isn't really the point, though. I enjoyed it in spite of its issues, in spite of anything the devs wanted it to be or what it was supposed to elicit. I liked it for my own reasons, and it will always stick with me for my own reasons. At the end of the day, for a game to leave an impact on me, to stand out among a sea of games that are more fun, but nothing else, <coughs> I'll take 358 mundane days with some of my favorite characters any day.